Okay, welcome everyone to this uh, new session um, on uh, public investment, but also on the presentation of the memo to the ECFIN commissioner. Um, so we have a, a panel with four uh, speakers. In the order of, uh, of speaking, we have Maria de Mertzis, my uh, former colleague at, at Bruegel, now chief economist with the conference board as of today. Uh, so welcome to this, uh, this new role. Um, followed by Deborah Revoltella, uh, Chief Economist of the EIB, the European Investment Bank. Then we have uh, Martin Verve, uh, uh, the Director General for, um, of the ECFIN, uh, Director General at the, with the Commission. And finally, uh, Thomas Aimo, who is um, uh, Director General for Economic and Financial Affair with the, with the Council. So it's a very uh, economic um, panel. <coughs> and we are going to address the issue of uh, both issues, as I mentioned uh, before, um, public investment and the role of the, uh, the challenges uh, for the uh, uh, ECFIN commissioner um, with uh, eight minutes for each speaker uh, in, in turn, starting with Maria. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jean, for the introductions. And uh, indeed, the, uh, <clears throat> I think the, 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 the title of the whole conference uh, could have been uh, investments, uh, how to achieve greater investments and your closed gaps. So in the, in the context of this session, I mean, the, we wrote, uh, um, and I had the honor of, uh, of co-writing the memo to the uh, uh, ECFIN, new ECFIN commissioner, the incoming commissioner for ECFIN, for Economics and Financial Affairs. Um, and, and of course, the, the part of investments is uh, of how to achieve greater investments from all sources of financing is absolutely crucial. But there's also other things that pertain to the portfolio of the commissioner that I wanted to, to, to touch on. And of course, that have repercussions for, for investment. And of course, the first thing to, to say is where, where we are at. On the economic outlook, uh, through a, we have been through a huge shock that has left Europe actually bruised. Uh, maybe we've come down on inflation and interest rates are now coming down, but on, on the outlook, we are uh, still lagging behind, particularly uh, some uh, important big uh, economies. And that, of course, uh, it, it reflects also the productivity gap. If you compare the European uh, um, uh, region uh, with other regions of the world, the US and, and Asia. So that's, that's the, the first thing to notice where we're at. The second thing to notice, which of course is of relevance to the port portfolio of the commissioner, is, is the RRF. We are at the halfway point as the new commissioner and the new commission comes in. Um, we have seen 40% disbursements of the grants, a uh, bit less on the loans, 27%. But the interesting thing about the RRF is uh, that um, uh, the EU countries have only met 20% of the milestones that are uh, in, uh, is, uh, in their uh, recovery and resilience uh, plans. It was an interesting discussion back in the, this morning on the budget uh, uh, discussion on whether uh, uh, this is too small, this is too big. Uh, the fact of the matter is the numbers are what they are and we have deadlines. Uh, the question is, are we going to keep them or were they too ambitious to begin with? And if we don't meet them, what does that mean for the, uh, uh, for the money in the pot? And then the last thing to notice, of course, is the European semester. Part of the European semester, the fiscal framework, is coming back into operation after suspending for the past three or four years. Um, and uh, um, that, of course, is an, an interesting thing in itself, and I'll come back to that. Uh, and we have the macroeconomic imbalances procedure, where, where the Commission has already identified eight countries that have got imbalances, three of which have got excessive imbalances. So, you know, the, what are the policies that uh, will revert that? So in terms of the challenges for the Commission, uh, the Commission um, in the next in the next uh, five years, uh, we have in the memo uh, grouped them into three categories. The first one is what I said earlier on on the fiscal framework, uh, a painstakingly negotiation to get into a set of new rules that are better rules, but nevertheless a political compromise. Um, we need to make sure, and this is something that we, you will hear from Bruegel uh, staff very often, uh, the issue of credible implementation uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the new uh, rules right from the outset. I think it's crucial for the validity of the new rules uh, that we implement them in the spirit that they are written, but credibly. 
Then the second challenge, and this is something that I refer to also in the, in the morning session, is, and it pertains very much to the lack of investments, is this idea that we have huge investment caps and the numbers vary depending on what you include on the one hand, but we have uh, current account surpluses uh, uh, that are beginning to come back after a small break due to the uh, energy crisis. They're coming back and they are, they are big and they're very similar to what they were before uh, the, um, the last three or four years of crisis. 2.5% um, is the estimate of the European Commission of GDP for 2025. It amounts to more or less, as I said this morning, uh, the uh, annual investment uh, needs um, for the next uh, six or seven years. Uh, that is uh, an important challenge that we want to identify. How do we re correct for this inconsistency? And then the last thing in terms of challenges is um, CSR, as the country uh, specific recommendations, a very important tool as part of the European semester. Um, we need to improve, uh, we feel, as the authors of this memo feel, that we need to improve uh, the implementation of the country specific recommendations for two reasons. First of all, because they're a good thing to have. Country level reforms are absolutely essential for both the productivity of a country and also the resilience uh, of the economies, but more uh, perhaps of relevance also to um, uh, procedures, uh, the CSR implementation, it was a requirement uh, for the national reform plans. So the challenge here is to provide uh, what is what we call objective assessment uh, of uh, um, uh, the way that the, the plans, the country plans are, are proceeding, uh, but without necessarily blocking all the, uh, the good things that have happened on this, on this regard. So, you know, the recommendations that uh, the memo puts forward um, again, huge emphasis on, on how do we uh, find, how do we finance uh, uh, investments in the next five years and perhaps beyond that for five years for the term of the next commission. And, and, and here we have very two, three, two, three specific recommendations. The first one is for the remainder of the lifetime of InvestEU, which is a program already in operation, we need to maximize the EU value added. The, the, the term EU public goods has been used repeatedly in all the sessions. Here is, a correct, here is a very important instrument in operation, finance projects that are of direct EU value added on the priorities uh, that we deem uh, necessary. Uh, then in terms of uh, closing the gap between the investment needs and the private money that is leaving, I mean, reforms here, in theory, we would use the CSR uh, tool, try to use the CSR tool to promote uh, uh, you know, structural reforms that are going to create a dynamism that will help private capital uh, to stay in Europe and perhaps foreign private capital coming in. Um, then, and here I'm, I'm delighted that, that Deborah is, is here with us. I mean, I think there is, uh, uh, to the extent that we need to use public money uh, to uh, um, uh, attract private money, but also to use public money in, in itself. Uh, I think the EIB has a very important role to play. And we've, we've talked about this actually in previous occasions, but I, 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 I mean, you know, the EIB has got a remarkable uh, tracking record in, in the past 20 years, um, which means that you know, it has buffers uh, to take on risks which are necessary to attract, the, the, to, to leverage up to attract the private money. And I think uh, to the extent that the private sector is not coming into risky projects, uh, and risky projects that have to do with uh, both the green and the digital transition, the unknown unknowns, here the public sector in the form of uh, uh, the EIB can play an increased role uh, and, uh, and increase the leverage of the, public, of the, of the private sector. Um, I would like to remain unapologetic about re <laughs> repurposing the EU budget. I think it's absolutely essential to have a clean look at what the EU budget does. And, you know, we heard Andre this morning talking about are we doing this intelligently? Is the very least we need to do on the budget. The uh, DG ECOFIN will have a role to play there. It's not just your jurisdiction, but you will have a role uh, to play. And finally, of course, operationalize the fiscal framework, new fiscal framework, and apply the excessive deficit uh, procedure in ways that are consistent and that emphasize the importance of debt sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, Deborah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm really happy, actually, to, to comment after the presentation of, um, of uh, the proposal to the commissioner, because I really, I actually told Maria before, I really very much share what she was saying about the economic assessment, the task identified, and the three proposed priorities. I would just think that the commissioner has to be a little bit more ambitious in the way of working, and actually we should think about 
uh, not only an uh, enhanced mandate, but uh, really to look at uh, the way in which uh, we try to deliver. And uh, if I think about investment, uh, um, the, the Commission is uh, proposing uh, to be the investment uh, commission for competitive uh, prosperous and secure Europe. We come uh, from uh, a longer period in which uh, uh, delivering on investment has been at uh, the center of uh, the policy uh, discussion. We started uh, to see really the issue of uh, big investment gaps. I personally wrote a report in 2012, I think, of, uh, at the time uh, of the Juncker plan uh, starting on that. And uh, since then, uh, a big chunk of uh, the policy action at uh, the European level and also at uh, the national level is has been deliver on investment. And we still are now here saying we don't do enough on investment. So just thinking that continue to work in the same way, we will deliver this time. I think we have to be really ambitious on how much we put it at the center and trying to be a bit also more revolutionary on what we bring there. So that's the first point. Somehow in the report I saw you, you were like a work as user boost a little bit. I think you really have to boost the way of uh, coordinating the work. Then uh, if uh, we think about uh, delivering on investment, uh, you mentioned the, actually the commission number of 500 billion euro per year to deliver for uh, the net zero and uh, the digital transition. To this, uh, you add the defense, uh, you add the skills, and I think uh, you have uh, a lot of things to add. Uh, I think I very much like actually what uh, uh, Jean Pisani Ferry wrote, the fact of putting into context and saying that these are still achievable numbers, we can do it. So it's not something uh, that, uh, that uh, is uh, um, too difficult to, to achieve. But what is important, I think, and sometimes uh, we, we are always uh, focusing on the headline numbers, but I think uh, what is also important is uh, to really have uh, real transformative investment uh, that achieve uh, what we really want, uh, so we, uh, that uh, uh, really achieve uh, this uh, transformational effect. And then uh, in these points, uh, three elements are important. I think uh, we need uh, much more uh, EU vision and coordination. We can discuss uh, what is a EU public good, uh, what is a national public good, uh, uh, but uh, in any case, uh, it's clear uh, we need uh, more coordination also when uh, the, the deployment of public investment is at the national level. We need a much better instrument to coordinate it at the EU level for a European objective. The second point is quality control of spending. I think, again, national level, EU level, uh, we see it very much as an institution, as the, the European Investment Bank. We have an ex-ant assessment of economic rate of return of the projects, ex-post validation of the results. I think this quality control, particularly on public, public investment, is extremely important. And then uh, also technical capacity in implementation of public investment. We talked a lot about it. I think uh, we as an institution always say that uh, because uh, we see it on the ground, uh, the technical capacity is still pretty weak in many countries. And I think it's all, all also coming back uh, um, in the recovery resilient facility somehow. And then uh, um, the third point is uh, the catalytic effect. And I think uh, that's uh, really, we all know, um, a large part of the investment that we have to come to the private sector. So finding a better way for catalyzing uh, the private uh, contribution uh, to the investment uh, that we need uh, is essential. And in that point of view, also better coordination at the European level is uh, relevant. So where do we stand in terms of investment? I think uh, the good uh, story is uh, that uh, somehow we Come, we are in a phase uh, in which uh, investment has, has proven uh, more resilience uh, to cyclical moves. Actually, with the cycle that we have seen in the last year, we were kind of surprised of how, how much resilient investment was. A lot was also the public, public investment uh, because of a structural factor. But overall, overall uh, we have seen a more resilient to the crisis, but also more affected by structural factor. Structural factor on the positive, but in some countries uh, you start seeing uh, how the negative perception of structural factor can really 
spring in a negative spiral. So I think we have to think at these two elements. In terms of government investment, actually is going pretty well so far. Since 2017, we have seen a steady growth. 2022 was interesting because inflation surprised many member states in the budget period, so they actually reacted with a little bit of a depriorization of public investment and even the recovery resilience facility helped. But 2023 is really very much positive on the upside in terms of even in real term with the data that, that we can look at. What we also see on the uh, it's uh, that uh, um, grants have been increasing uh, massively, and grants uh, can, be, can be also catalytic for investment, but uh, actually they are quite at high level, at 1% of uh, GDP at uh, the moment. And uh, we, we have to think how we use uh, this instrument actually more coordinated way also at the European level. Going forward, uh, what can we expect? And here I think uh, there are... Uh, ad we have a lot to do in terms of delivering on public investment and private investment as well. Um, we can think that uh, some of the factors that have support public investment uh, so far uh, may naturally somehow soften, and partly the fact that uh, we will have a more... Uh, less fiscal room, if you want, and the normally countries that prioritize public investment. There is a lot of discussion on the fiscal framework, whether the new fiscal framework will be detrimental or not. I don't think it will be detrimental, but I think somehow it may have been more protective of public investment. I don't think it's constraining, but it could have been more, uh, could have been more uh, to be more protective of uh, public investment uh, um, in period of, uh, of uh, uh, consolidation. Uh, on the RRF, the Court of Auditor came out with a relatively negative, I would say, uh, um, reporters speaking about the delays. I'm personally, and it's not an official view, but I'm personally quite positive. I think we could expect a lot of what we are seeing from the beginning. I think there are two elements that are very interesting to look at. Once we try to look at measures that are being delayed or investment projects that are being delayed, and what you see that it's easier for projects that are associated to infrastructure investment. The whole part of infrastructure investment is easier to be delayed. I think it's an indication of one fact, that the countries are very bad in knowing how much does it take to build a bridge. So it's again an issue of a technical capacity at the public sector level. That's my reading, and it's something on technical capacity. The second point that I wanted to, to mention is on the cross-border nature, where much more needed to be done. And I think we talk also with, maybe it was not the right instrument, but again, we needed to do much more in terms of the cross-border nature. And it comes um, to the point that, uh, and, I, <laughs> and, I, and I leave it there, um, that uh, I think that uh, where we really have to think more is uh, how can you, we use a much better project of common interest and uh, the planning and the money associated to that, I think that's uh, really an, an area where uh, we have to to really think how to expand and do much more on that point of view. I have been too long, I just uh, say, Two things, we need to catalyze the private investment. Catalyzing private investments has so far has been a lot only through grants. I think there is a lot also to do. There is the part of incentive and catalyzing financing, but a lot on reducing a barrier to investment. That's really clear. And then connecting to the panel upstairs, I think a capital market union has a real upside rule of creating opportunity for investment, and that's also something that we should work on. Thank you. Thank you for these two presentations. Now we turn to the... Uh, to the policymakers, and uh, let me ask first Martin Verve about uh, how he reacts to uh, the presentations that were made, and especially to the recommendations made in the in the memo to the ECFIN commissioner. Yeah, with uh, with pleasure. Well, let me let me start by uh, 
uh, with congratulating Bruegel for preparing these memos, uh, know from experience that, that that is quite a big big job. So uh, well well done. Now there's a lot uh, also in the in the memo specific to to uh, to Ekfin that I can easily agree to. Um, I will not say too much about that because that, that 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 would be only boring. So so let me just just focus on some of the some of the issues where. Uh, we have a slightly uh, different different view, or, or a bit uh, where I want to put the nuance on it. Um, but but first, very briefly on uh, on the short uh, on on the outlook on the economic outlook, where I broadly agree with what what has been uh, has been said. So the short term economic outlook is actually rather benign. So for for next year, we we uh, expect growth. Uh, around 1.6 percent. We expect inflation to be around uh, 2 percent. We expect uh, unemployment to be around 6 percent, and we expect the aggregate deficit actually to be below 3 percent. So, pretty pretty decent marks, I would say, at the start of this mandate. But but clearly the the, the challenges uh, are, are more related to the, to the medium uh, medium term. They are very well known. They relate to, uh, to the, the transition, the green transition. They relate to security uh, and defense. They relate to, to uh, the impact of uh, demography uh, on, on future growth uh, potential. They relate to lacking uh, productivity trends. And uh, if you take all that together, I, I would fully agree with, with, uh, with Bruegel that uh, this requires massive investments, and, uh, but also reforms to, to turn this around. The complication, obviously, is that fiscal space um, is, is rather, rather limited after two major, major crises. And um, so and that, that points to, to the need to, to, for, for making sharp choices. And, and also to, to uh, spend your money in, 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 in a way that gives you the biggest bang for, for your buck. And that, that's exactly how I understand the, uh, of how I've understood the memo of, uh, of Bruegel is, is basically pointers to, to how, how, we can, how we can achieve that. So, so uh, that, that, that is very welcome. Um, now, then, then a few concrete points. Now, first, first point, and, and obviously we, we agree, a key challenge for, for the next commission or for the incoming commissioner is to make sure that the revised fiscal rules uh, get off to, to a good start. Member states are in the process of preparing these plans. They will come uh, shortly, uh, actually. And, and one of the probably first tasks of, of a new commissioner is actually to assess uh, to assess these the, these plans. So, so this is this is right at the start of the mandate an extremely important uh, important um, point. Now, where I would agree that and, and there is a notion here in, in 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 the memo that says well investments are constrained by the new rules. Now I, I would definitely agree that investment, also investment, like other government expenditure, are in some way constrained by, by, by the rules. Um, this should, however, not be been read that the, the new rules make it more difficult uh, to, 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 to make, make investments. Uh, no, as, as a matter of fact, the new rules contain a number of very strong incentives for, uh, to protect investment compared to the old rules. But clearly, if you compare it to a situation where there are no rules or where, where, where rules are suspended, yes, clearly clear some constraint comes, comes from, uh, from that. But, but the rules may help to, to prioritize budget, budgetary expenditure, and that, that's, I think, the purpose of, of these budgetary rules. Now, um, second point, and again, I start with a point of agreement. Uh, obviously, um, fiscal resources also at the EU level are constrained, so we need to make best use of what we have, and that includes RRF funding. But uh, I have to say, uh, and a bit like the Warren, uh, I, I, I think the, the uh, reporting on the, on the uh, absorption of the RRF has been overly negative, actually. And... and, and uh, and I don't think it's, it's justified. So, so let's simply, simply look, look at the facts. So, so to date, uh, we, uh, we have spent 265 billion uh, euro under the, under the IRF. Now, 23% of all the milestones and targets that have been agreed 
uh, have been assessed so far as being met, uh, have been assessed. But one should realize that we make assessment after the fact. So the, you need to add in another 18% of, uh, of milestones and targets, which, which have been reported already as, uh, as met. So, 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 so they will come simply in later, uh, a later payment, uh, payment request. Now, we've seen that the, that the implementation has gathered steam throughout this year, and we expect that by the end of the year, we will be well, well above 300, uh, 300 billion. Now, that is still slightly below where we had hoped to be. But let's be clear. I mean, this is much, much, much faster than any EU budget instrument we have, uh, we've had before. Uh, and and so, so I, I, I'm a bit surprised that the criticism really focuses now on, on the IRF, which, which a bit similar is on, uh, on CS, CSI implementation. And clearly, let, let's be clear, we want uh, more uh, and better CSI implementation. But again, compared to the past, uh, we, we are seeing uh, really a jump in, uh, in the implementation of the, of the, of the CSI. And, and as a matter of fact, so, so it's with, with some 17%, but that's 17% compared to 51%. So it's a 30% increase compared to the past. Now, clearly, we want to go to, uh, to 100%. Um, but I think one needs to recognize that, that actually the IRF is, is making, making an impact. And the reason I'm saying that is not to defend uh, uh, my work or that of my coll uh, colleagues, but we are also thinking about the future. And, uh, and, and I would say that for the future, uh, indeed, we would need to learn the lessons from, from the IRF, but, uh, but I think there are some pretty positive lessons actually to be learned here, and, and that and should not be overshadowed by, 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 by the criticism. Now, the last, last point that I would like to, like to make, uh, and there's many more things to say, but, but uh, we have limited time. Um, so Bruegel uh, suggests to rethink the role of, of ESM, and, and notably to, to see whether ESM can get, uh, get a role in attraction of, of private, uh, private capital. Now here, I, I would just like to sound a word of, of caution. I would really caution against too much bricolage here. Uh, and and uh, knowing that in the past I've been part of certain bricolage that, that had, to, had, to uh, had to be done in, at, the, at the height of financial and euro crisis. But um, throughout, uh, or in response to the financial crisis, we have created new structures, we have created new, uh, new initiatives. And, and I think it, it might be a good idea to take one step back again and, and look more at, at the overall architecture and, and, and see, okay, but is this the most efficient way to organize ourselves rather than in a piecemeal way start to, to add tasks to here, here and there or to, to take them away? So, so that's, that's what I uh, would have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, should remind everyone that you were the inventor of the EFSF and um, that what you, you just said in terms of, uh, you know, instead of, of tinkering, building for uh, a better future, uh, that's a plan that uh, you, we may wish to go back to. Thomas, you're the last speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean. I'm, frankly, I'm not sure if uh, the EFSF is what, what Martin wants to be remembered about, but uh, okay. So uh, on investment, <coughs> uh, important item um, and, 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 and needs a great deal of focus in, uh, uh, by the next uh, commission. Uh, and, and, and a very good memo by, by Bruegel, but I'd like to uh, add a bit of nuance and, and, and concentrating in, in, in so doing on, um, on matters related to the green transition. Uh, Martin spoke quite a bit about the, 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 that the starting point is scarcity. We need to, to find a way to use public money in, a, in, in the best uh, possible uh, manner, and I, I, I think that is uh, exactly 
true. We've all heard this um, ginormous numbers like 600 billion a year for the green transition. I don't know whether that number is, is too big or too small, but I, no doubt it's, 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 a, it's going to be a big, big number. Uh, and, and, and that this, this amount is well beyond the ability of, of national or European taxpayers to, 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 to bankroll. The, the silver lining, though, is that um, most of the 600 billion does not need to be new money. So we, we, we haven't, we have not been getting our energy free so far either. We have been paying for our energy. So uh, th th there is some money on the table already that we can uh, re-divert. Incidentally, I saw uh, Jean today at Financial Times uh, speaking matters related exactly to, to, to this issue and, and he was kind of um, skeptical whether, whether um, I mean his, his, his starting point is that this is negative supply shock basically. Uh, and this may be the case but I'm, I'm less sure about that than I was a, a few years ago having seen the the price trends of of uh, of, of the the, um, the investment goods in in, in like, like solar panels and, and 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 wind turbines, I don't think we know that we will end up in an energy landscape that is more expensive than the one that we left behind. Uh, it may be the other way around. What we do know is that the the the, the cost sort of profile over time is going to be different. This is capital heavy. Uh, and, and, and fuel light, uh, in a way. So, uh, but but the silver lining is that this is something that private sector should be able uh, to to uh, to do, given proper access to financial markets, given proper functioning uh, of the of the, the the energy markets, and and this is, I think, the task for the public authorities to think about. Maria uh, mentioned that, uh, that, that if, I, if I heard her correctly, uh, that, that, that public funds should um, help private sectors finance risky projects, which uh, in principle, yes, but, but, but I'd like to nuance that a little bit uh, the the to the extent we are talking about sort of uh, financing of innovation that is inherently risky i agree but the bulk of the investment cost in green transition is not r and d it's very mundane solar panels uh, it's it, it's about it's about wind uh, wind wind turbines uh, and there, the risk is not a technological one, it's a market risk. We're not quite sure whether these investments are long-term economically viable, given the markets that they are facing. And I don't think this is a risk the public sector should carry. I am quite convinced that, 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 that our countries are right now doing policy mistakes, providing subsidies, providing uh, feed-in tariffs, uh, contracts for difference for primary energy production, and this, uh, this, this is likely to be expensive and inefficient way of making the, making the transition. Instead, I think where public money should uh, concentrate, and, and I'm, I'm aware that there is another uh, session coming after that that concentrates on, on precisely that is 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 to to provide a market infrastructure that is able to 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 absorb uh, the new uh, sources of of uh, of renewable energy which are intermittent by nature it puts new requirements on 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 the energy infrastructure electricity infrastructure in particular it needs uh, uh, much better ability to transport uh, electricity over longer distances uh, geographically, cross-border, which is uh, wobble insufficient right now. Uh, 
and of course it needs to, to some extent storage and, and, and uh, adjustable capacity. But most of all it needs a vision, it needs a European vision. Someone here in this city needs to have an idea of where the assets are, where the demand will be, and how to connect these. And right now, I don't think uh, we are thinking nearly enough uh, that issue. That is where I, I, I think the, the effort should be um, should be in the future. Uh, the memo mentions uh, um, uh, EU public goods, and I think that is precisely the right starting point. I wish uh, the memo would have developed a little further what this actually is. Um, it kind of just mentions it and leaves it at that. I fear that with all the sort of uh, benefits that the RRF has, has brought uh, to Europe, and, and uh, I think uh, Martin is, is, uh, is, is correct in stating that it, it's, it's, it's being kind of uh, misassessed. Uh, the, the yardstick is, is, is not necessarily the right one. But I don't think it has been particularly efficient in providing European public goods. The cross-border elements of the RRF, uh, the RRPs are minuscule. It's very little in terms of if you look at where, where say, green transition money goes, there's a small handful of cross, uh, genuine cross-border uh, investment projects. Uh, and uh, this is something that needs to needs to change in the the, the uh, in the next uh, uh, next institutional cycle. So I would very much wish to see the next commission to take more assertive control of the 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 the, um, the European perspective, systemic view of what the needs are, and concentrating on European financing on on the the the, the cross border elements. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to open the floor in a, in a short while and also on Slido because I don't see any, any question on Slido. I remind you, you, you can, for those online, you can ask your question on Slido. Uh, I'd like to, to, to react with, to, to what Thomas just said about uh, you know, the, the nature of the, of the green transition. Um, they, I never considered that the, by nature, the new uh, uh, green system would be less efficient than the current one. Uh, I don't think we, we know. But I think we know something for sure is that it requires much more investment in the meantime. And that's when I, I, I say it has a character of a negative supply shock because it has a character of requiring more investment just to produce essentially the same thing, a certain quantity of energy. Um, so that's, that was my, my reaction. Uh, do you, Maria and, uh, and Deborah, do you want to, to respond to some of the points made, uh, Maria? This issue of the uh, of the I mean you know the, what kind of risks the public sector could take to, to Thomas's point, I, I totally agree with your point on the market risk. I don't think this is something that the public sector should take. This is not what the memo says or indeed what we believe, but it is exactly the cross border nature. And when and you're thinking about European public goods that can't be financed by European public money, uh, it is exactly what we have in mind. It is this cross border that is an obstacle. If you think about infrastructure investments, grids on the electricity, on the energy. I mean, these are the types of things that we can, we can see that this is the best use of European public money is exactly on this, the cross-border element. Just Deborah. On the cross-border uh, element, I fully agree. And I think, uh, and uh, what I, I was also mentioning before, and there is also a lot of uh, cost of uh, non-coordinated uh, national intervention uh, where uh, you would have a much better benefit. We calculate, it's a, it's a strange computation, but uh, we, we calculate what is uh, the effect of our investment, uh, uh, the, the long-term 
the long-term effect of our investment uh, in terms of uh, economic growth is a little bit a uh, complicated model, etc. But uh, we find out uh, that on our uh, invest, the support, uh, the investment that we support, uh, one third of the long-term effect is coming uh, from spillover effect. Uh, uh, spillover effect and I think that's uh, something important uh, to think about uh, how can we really look more at uh, this uh, spillover effect part and I think uh, with uh, the energy transition is clear the importance of uh, thinking it also for the energy energy market at uh, the cross-border nature so uh, yes Martin yeah. also two two things here first um, I, I fully agree that, that uh, when it comes to cross-border projects, the RF is is not uh, has not been particularly successful. So, so, so that the point that I, however, would like to make and clarify is that cross-border project is not the same as European public goods. So, I think there are uh, uh, quite a few uh, European public goods that are very well served from the R, uh, from from the RF, but but are simply not cross-border. But, but on that said, um, still, uh, I, I would agree that for next commission, it's important to, 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 to also uh, invest in these cross-border uh, projects or so. Um, the, the, the second point, and that's more in, re uh, in reaction to you, Sean, it's, 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 and I don't have a right or wrong uh, answer here. It's, it's basically you say, well, you have to invest to produce essentially the same the same thing right? for for uh, with the energy transition. I would say that up to a point that is 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 true, but but um, I think there are clearly certain benefits that go beyond simply the production of the, of the energy, which and which are maybe sometimes overlooked in the uh, in, in 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 the discussion. Uh, they they go beyond. Also, the climate, uh, the climate impact. Uh, for example, better insulated houses is well clearly that that is helpful for reducing energy consumption. But these are also simply more pleasant houses to uh, to work in. Similarly, with with electrical vehicles, uh, yeah, maybe better for the climate, but but also uh, less noisy, less uh, better for 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 health. So I think we should pay attention to these benefits as well and not only uh, portray it as something which is uh, a cost to, to, to people. Thanks. I, I, I agree. Um, let me open the floor to questions. Uh, so I see one over there, Francesco. From Bruegel. Now, if you look at the title of the session, it seems that the only issue is to increase public investment. But then we heard uh, Deborah Revoltella and Martin uh, Wewe uh, talking about the quality uh, of the uh, investment. Uh, and I wonder whether you are willing to engage into a simulation. I mean, you are given 100 of political capital, and you have to spend that either on increasing investment or increasing the quality of investment. How would you share your 100 of uh, political capital between these two uh, objectives? Question uh, here, the second, and one uh, towards, yes, in the middle of the. Filippo Favan, Center for Global Transformation Studies. Uh, first, thanks, uh, thanks for, for the discussion. So, uh, I would like to ask about uh, your assessment uh, of the, I would say, potential of the public investments to address. Uh, the issue of the European growth and industry competitiveness, especially in the light of the defense, uh, I would say climate and digital spendings. Thank you. Thank you. One question over there and one behind. Uh, good afternoon, Jorge Valero with Bloomberg. It's a question for Martin and whoever Can you wants speak to. Up a bit? Uh, Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Jorge Valero with Bloomberg. It's a question for Martin and whoever wants to react. Um, given that um, there is no EU money available, um, no more EU money available right now, the next MFF will start only after 2028. Um, 
the question is whether you think that some additional EU money is needed before that MFF. If the only common good that could uh, gather enough support, north, south, east, west, is defense, or also, for example, clean energy. And what will be the shape of that instrument that will be implemented before the 2028? Will it be something as ambitious, uh, ambition as uh, next generation EU, or will it be something more like uh, the financial engineering of the Juncker plan? Thank you. Thank you. The person behind there and, and then. Thank you, uh, Stanislas Jordan, uh, Sustainable Finance Lab. I'd like to pick up on the point from Thomas about energy prices and whether the, the transition could actually make energy much cheaper. I think it's an hopeful scenario and one we should uh, try to, to make it work in a way. Um, I see two obstacles. Um, one is that, um, uh, the, as we said, those investments are super capital intensive. And when the ECB interest uh, rates go up, these are the investments that are um, first in line um, being affected. So wh whenever capital costs increase by 1% through the ECB interest rate, this multiplies by 20 times uh, on average for, for renewable industries. And then comes the issue about if you want energy prices to go down, ultimately from clean energy, you need to change the, 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 the energy pricing system, right? Because in a marginal pricing system, as we have today, gas is effectively setting the price. There is a study by the IMF that tends to show that you would need the share of green energy to be at least 85% in order for the renewable energy price to actually determine the overall sell price. So I think that you have those two things to change, right? So the first question is, don't we need some kind of green interest rate, as um, President Macron, for example, has, has mentioned? And second, don't we need to change also the, the energy price system so that actually this would reassure very much investors if they can know what better what will the future price will be that would also make uh, private funding easier to, to be channeled through. Thank you. Thank you. Last question there, and then we go back to the panel. From Jedi. Uh, first, I must say I'm a bit surprised that uh, when the court of auditor, that in the democratic system makes a recommendation, there's such a strong pushback from both the EIB and from the EU Commission, uh, I would expect more what are the solutions and not uh, they, are, they are not right or they're overly criticizing. Uh, in, in a normal, um, I mean, in a, in a private company, not investing 70% of the money allocated after four and a half years would get you fired. Uh, my question now, uh, I wanted to know um, on the quality of the investment. I heard on the panel that for public money, uh, it should be both ex, uh, uh, ex ante and ex post evaluation. I wanted to know if all the panel agrees with that. Is that not at the contrary, that public money should be much more there to trigger investment at where pub private money is not going, rather than to be overly cautious and being even more demanding for returns than a private investor, for example? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question on Slido. I'm going to add one, uh, which is uh, on aging. Uh, thing. Uh, aging um, is a great challenge for Europe, Europe's future. Uh, what does the Commission plan to do about it? Sorry? Sorry? Sorry it's about aging. Uh, a aging is a, bit, is a big challenge for Europe's future. What are the plans of the Commission to, to deal with the, this challenge? Um, and the other one, uh, it's, about, uh, it's about grids and, uh, and the fact that grids require public support, um, especially when they're cross-border. Uh, shall we go in uh, reverse order? Thomas. All right, thanks. Um, I, I'll, I'll pick and choose. I have a, a machine here screaming in my ear. I have a bit difficulties, uh, difficulties hearing all the questions. But I think the first one was whether the, the uh, political capital should be spent in, 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 uh, in improving the quality or quantity of, of public investment. I think it depends on, a, on the exchange rate, how much 
political capital you, you consume on, on, on each one. But, I mean, I, I, I think I, I, may, I may turn out to be naive and wrong, uh, but I hope that, uh, that there are aspects, and, and particularly these cross-border aspects uh, in, 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 in green transition where we can communicate to, to, to the member states, and member states can come to a consensus that this is beneficial for everyone, and that uh, that you don't uh, need to to spend much uh, political capital to improve the the quality of of uh, of public investment, at least at the European level. Uh, I, I, and, and that's that's the the one I'm 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 mainly mainly concentrating on. Um, the second question was was public investment for uh, its role in in, in uh, underlying competitiveness of, of of Europe, and I think here uh, clearly the our enterprises are suffering from a structurally higher. Uh, cost structure and, and a big part of that is 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 uh, energy prices. So clearly, this is a this is weighing on on uh, on uh, our company's competitiveness. And if we can fix um, fix that by an ef efficient and effective green transition, I think this is uh, this is very much one of the big ticket items. I would say um, in, in top two, alongside with, with uh, the development of capital markets as, uh, as a sort of uh, on, on the to-do list of, of, uh, of um, uh, on, on the road to, towards better competitiveness. Um, whether we should think uh, of some innovative sources of uh, EU money before 2028, I think uh, I think we should. Uh, I mean, 2028 is actually coming quite soon. Uh, the 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 first uh, MFF uh, sort of uh, um, exercises will start next year, uh, and I, I I don't think. I don't think it makes sense to start talking about something uh, intermediate. Um, I, I don't think there is a realistic prospect of agreeing something. Uh, the MFF is is, is 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 actually coming our way in a fairly uh, appropriate moment. We have enough time uh, to 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 uh, to have a good discussion on it, and. Um, Final question that I managed to pick up is whether the energy pricing system needs reform. I never re really understood what the need for reform is. I, I don't think the the problem in in our energy market is uh, is is the, the 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 functioning of the market, the the, the day ahead market, the futures market, uh, the intraday markets. I think they are working well and efficiently. What is not working is is uh, our our sort of physical infrastructure uh, that is not coping well with uh, with uh, the the increasing share of of, uh, of of renewables and this point that that gas is the marginal pricing it's less and less true and it's 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 it's, it's still true in, in in some parts of Europe and I I, I guess big, big chunks of Europe but it's not going to be true for long. Marginal prices are going to be determined by other things very soon. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, ju just a few quick reac reactions. First, on quality versus uh, versus quantity. I, th I think the reality will be that, that we, uh, well, there are clearly huge needs and we will have less public resources than, than the needs. That, 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 uh, that's the one thing that we, know, uh, that we know almost for sure, certainly at the EU level. So which means, uh, regardless of, 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 of quantities, uh, we need to pay uh, big attention to, 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 to quality. So, so for me, uh, given, given the fiscal constraints that are there, that, that, that is going to be the big challenge going, uh, going forward. 
Now, is, is, uh, I think indeed there was a question, well, are we going to see new initiatives before uh, the, uh, the end of um, the MFF period? Uh, the honest answer is I don't know, because uh, I mean, I'm also waiting for a new, new commission and, 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 and plans. Um, so we will, will need to see. I mean, it, what is clear, there are big, big common, uh, common needs. But think, for example, secur security and, and, and defense. Uh, these are new. They had not been, been foreseen uh, before. But there are different ways of, 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 of dealing and different preference probably also in, in, dealing, in dealing with, uh, with, with this. So let me not say much more about that. Then on absorption, there's clearly a misunderstanding uh, here, which, which I need to, need to clarify. The, um, the IRF runs until the end of 26. Uh, so it's, it's not the case that there will be an under, underspending of 70% on the IRF uh, budget, uh, very far from it. So, so what we see is uh, a modest uh, um, deviation from, from, from the planned expenditure. I'm, I'm not hiding that at all, but, but I wanted to put this in perspective that uh, give, given the, 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 the original size of the, 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 uh, the IRF, I think the IRF has been doing relatively well compared to other uh, EU uh, instruments, both current instruments and in the past. I think this is not disrespect, uh, disrespectful at all. This is a statement of facts. That's the... Uh, then uh, on what, uh, uh, what the Commission is, is doing about aging, again, I, I, I cannot speak for, for, for the next Commission, so, so let me, let me uh, keep it close to home to, 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 uh, to, to DG, DG Ekfin. Clearly, already for, for a long period of time, aging is very, very uh, high on our, our radio, uh, radio, uh, radio screen. Um, so we, we have the, the aging report for those that, that are not familiar with it. I, 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 I would, uh, would really recommend it. Clearly, projections uh, on, on age, aging projections, they do play a big role in, uh, in also projections for, for, the, for the fiscal sustainability. And, and in particular, through the new uh, fis fiscal rules, they, they also uh, are translated more directly back into uh, in, in, into our fiscal uh, fiscal assessment. So, so it is a, it is an important topic, but clearly DG Ekfin looks at a part of it, and there's much more much more to be said uh, said about it. But but uh, I'm not aware of any new partic particular initiatives in this domain for the next commission. We'll we'll, we'll see. Thanks. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, so, uh, yes, uh, I, I will just uh, take a couple, a couple of points. So one on the quality on, uh, or uh, quantity. I think uh, um, there uh, I, would, uh, I would say maybe for uh, my background, I always, uh, my background will push me to say more of the European public good, but I come from living uh, more than, and working uh, more than 20 years uh, out of my home countries. And I think uh, the appetite uh, in, is uh, very much uh, changing from countries to countries. So you need to be realistic. And I think on the realistic side, uh, I would put a lot of pressure on uh, the coordination part in this moment uh, being uh, coordinated, even if it's national, much more coordination, uh, and on the quality point of view. And then if uh, we can go on more quantity of public investment, uh, that uh, would be, and uh, particularly EU public good, uh, that uh, would be also um, uh, very good. On uh, the um, quality, another question on quality, on, uh, actually on the court of auditor, on the pushback on the court of auditor, I didn't want to have a pushback. Uh, to, to, to sound like having a pushback. I think it's a just, I think it's a just a natural that, uh, and it's something that we have seen uh, again uh, since the Juncker plan, uh, that uh, public investment, delivering on public investment is difficult in many, many countries. And really the technical capacity at the local level is uh, to be strengthened. And I think it's uh, something that uh, on the ground is very clear and uh, everybody has to do more. And that's only, I would, that's uh, the message that, uh, that uh, I wanted uh, to pass. And then uh, whether public investment uh, should have quality control, I definitely think yes. 
at least uh, knowing uh, what uh, you want uh, to achieve uh, with uh, the public investment. Uh, you can do it in a speedy way, you may do it uh, in a uh, simplified way, but uh, definitely you need uh, uh, the quality control. Um, I think uh, I leave it here. Thank you. Maria, you have the last word. <laughs> yeah, sure, thank you, John. Uh, I, I think I need to also react to, to Francesco's uh, question. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter, Francesco, is that I don't think this is a choice. I mean, I don't, I, if, if we had the choice between better or more, I would always go for better. But I don't think this is a choice. The fact of the matter is that the European firms are not investing in Europe. They're coming out of the European borders. So if the private sector is not investing, who will invest? Uh, and, 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 you know, this is what we're talking here. We're talking about public and all instruments that are available on the public front need to be on the table. Nothing should be off the table, given the gaps that we have. And then on, on the point on, on the, uh, the risks and the role of the, pi the public sector in trying and attracting private, I definitely agree that it is, it is those risks that the private sector will not pick up cross-border being one of them, of course of European public value, but of, you know, of productive value, can be picked up by public authorities. And this is why I believe that the EIB has an important role to play on exactly this, on this uh, uh, point. But equally, uh, if we want the EIB to take more risks, we also need to reckon with the fact that there, it, would be, it should be allowed to fail. That's what risks mean. Right, so uh, the EIB has got a very good uh, track record on this front. Uh, you know, it's important to demonstrate that they're taking more risks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to, to all the panelists. And uh, we are uh, sort of closing the session now. Uh, I think we have, a, do we have a break? Yeah, we do? Not 15 minutes break. Thank you.